Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Futures in Biotech is provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com. This is Futures in Biotech, episode 63, How to Use a Mouse. This episode of Futures in Biotech is brought to you by audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audible.com forward slash biotech. I believe that biotech is the next frontier. Probably the greatest intellectual revolution that's ever taken place uh, in man's history. DNA is the code for life. We're actually beginning to understand how life works, which I think is something that's mind-blowing in and of itself. There was uh, going to be a genetic component to aging. How long was there to be the extension? About 30, 40 percent for humans. That would equate to something like 20 to 30 years. How close are we to actually having a therapeutic? Ballpark, 10 years. It's potentially one of the things that might like rocking the world the same way that uh, people said, oh, the sun is the center of the universe, so this and that and everything. And now here's somebody who can come out and say, hey, look, here's how we compare it to our closest evolutionary relative. Welcome to Futures in Biotech. Today, our guest has greatly enhanced our ability to functionally dissect the human genome, which has in turn initiated a new 21st century frontier in medicine. He's a distinguished professor of human genetics and biology at the University of Utah and investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Um, he's won numerous prizes, the National Medal of Science, the National Science Foundation, uh, the Kyoto Prize, the Wolf Prize in Medicine, the Gardner Foundation International Award, the 2001 Albert Lasker Award, and finally, the 2007 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for his discoveries of principles for introducing specific gene modifications in mice by the use of embryonic stem cells. Welcome to the show, Dr. Mario Kepecki. Thank Kepecki. you. It's good to be here. You know, there's a, a lot. Uh, you've had a very, very interesting uh, life and career. Um, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a little bit uh, about your life because I, I believe it's, uh, you know, a very motivating um, uh, story. And in your autobiography at NobelPrize.org, um, you prefaced uh, that in 1996, as a Kyoto Prize laureate, you were asked to write an autobiographical sketch of your early upbringing. Um, their hope was to uncover potential influences or experience that may have been key to fostering a creative spirit within us. And in your own case, uh, you saw that despite the complete absence of an early nurturing environment, the intrinsic drive to make a difference in our world is not easily quenched. And that given the opportunity, early, handi early handicaps can uh, be overcome and dreams achieved. What did you mean by that? Uh, I mean, I think what's important is giving everybody an opportunity. Uh, that is, in terms of education, in the terms of being able to reach for whatever they uh, seek in terms of what they're dreaming about. So given that opportunity, then I think any child will prosper. Um, you, you, you did have some difficulties in, in early life, and you, you overcame them. Uh, would you like to talk a little bit about uh, that and how it influenced your life? Because uh, we could also talk about your early career at Harvard and go from there. Sure. I mean, I think the early influences are difficult uh, to, uh, to assess as to, you know, whether they were positive or negative. I mean, I think during that period of time, I was learning. I was learning things that weren't being taught in school. Uh, so I wasn't getting a formal education. But on the other hand, I was experiencing life and seeing what worked and what didn't work. And the main uh, thing that was important at that time was simply survival, that is being able to obtain food uh, and shelter. Uh, and so those are the things that preoccupied me, and I think it trained me to be patient. Um, do you, I, I suppose that it really it did indeed force you to, to learn how to ask a question and find a solution yourself. <laughs> yeah, no, you, you're completely self-reliant. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, you do seek out your own solutions and see what works and not seeing and also seeing, you know, how the pattern. I mean, a child doesn't question their environment. They simply are put into it and then they interact with that environment and see what works and what doesn't work. Uh, and I think that's actually a good life experience in terms of any uh, discipline, whether it be it science or uh, or any other discipline. 
Well, you made the best of it, which is really quite amazing, and I, I think is an inspiration to all. Do you, do you believe that um, you, uh, it's more important to want to make a difference in the world or to have sheer curiosity, or is it a combination? I, I think it's a combination. I mean, I think uh, curiosity is what uh, keeps you asking questions and, and seeing what's uh, known and what isn't known, and then probing the unknown. I think uh, the other, I think, is important in terms of uh, resilience and keeping on going. Uh, so I think, it's, uh, I think both aspects are important. Wow. Because, um, you know, uh, you, you take on gigantic uh, challenges and uh, I'm wondering, you know, how do you motivate yourself at that level to keep going, uh, considering how difficult science can be? Uh, well, I think, again, it's always, you know, it's always probing the unknown. I mean, the question I always ask myself, you know, where are we right now and where do we want to be and how do we uh, approach uh, getting there? That is, is the technology available to be able to address the questions we want to address? And if not, develop the technology or see if somebody else is developing that technology. So it's always a quest. Uh, so you're always, you know, probing forward, thinking about the future and seeing, uh, you know, how you can interact with it and it's exciting i mean you know one of the things about science is that it's never st static it's always changing so you're all the questions i'm addressing today are very different from what i was questioning five years from now will be very different from what i'm going to be asking five years from now well, so five years back and five years from now I'm, I'm smiling because you know some people tend to say well that technology is not there i'll invent it and some people say that Nobody's even thought about this technology, and I'll invent it. And um, I, I, I somewhat believe that you're in the category that's willing to take uh, risks at jumping as far as you can ahead in terms of technology and bring it, bring it to fruition. Um, uh, I think that's uh, one of the hallmarks of our lab is that we do uh, always seek, you know, what isn't available. Uh, and that often does require developing new technologies and seeing, you know, how would you even go about it? I mean, right now we're starting a project that will probably take 20 years to develop because we don't have the technology, but we know what we want to do. We simply don't know how to do it. <laughs> That's great. I, and you have a Plan B project and Plan C projects, I suppose, that are more oh, yes. concerning. <laughs> oh, yeah. So that's no, the secret. You do have to yeah. take that chance, right? Oh, yeah. You have, you have to, to, take to buy the lottery ticket. That's right. No, it's, it's always a big risk. And the bigger the jump, the bigger the risk because you literally have no idea how long it'll take you and where you, know, where you go. But you do have ways of assessing whether you're going in the right direction at least. <laughs> Well, yeah, <laughs> little, sometimes little eureka moments help you uh, get confidence, yep. I suppose. Yep. Uh, so I'd like to talk a little bit about your early career at Harvard and um, what was the environment like and how did it influence how you do science? Uh, I mean, I have uh, two uh, careers at Harvard. I mean, one as a student, and I was in Jim Watson's laboratory of Watson and Crick. And that was very exciting because that was just at the beginning of molecular biology. And you all of a sudden had a fusion, essentially, of physicists, chemists, biologists, geneticists, all coming together to start addressing questions in a new way. And so that, well, that was extremely exciting. Uh, and then I had a second career uh, as a faculty member at the medical school. Uh, and again, you know, that was a, a very good, very good scientist there, but they weren't going after what I was trying to seek. And, and therefore, after a while, I left and came to Utah. And how did the, the um, environment for scientists change from going uh, from Harvard uh, Medical School to, uh, to Utah? Uh, I, was it yeah. the frontier? It's a natural frontier. Well, there was, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, the reason I came here is one is uh, the ability to then participate in building a new department. And that has the excitement that you can bring together the kind of people that you want to work with. Uh, so that was one aspect of it. The other aspect was that I often want to work on long term uh, projects, ones that we may take 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, and that's a very difficult uh, environment to, Harvard was a difficult environment to pursue that simply because every day you're asked what's new. 
And pretty soon you start working on projects that a few days uh, will start generating new knowledge. Uh, and so you get short-term gratification, but not the ability or the luxury to be able to work on long-term projects. And I think that's what I uh, had at, uh, at Utah, and I still have. And so I can now still pursue things that I, you know, will take a long time to pursue. Oh, it's a beautiful balance. Uh, and and I, I think we should all uh, take stock in this, that not to necessarily go for the two-year project, but <laughs> aim, for, aim high no. and aim That's far. Right. No, and I um, think because a lot of questions that are of interest will actually take a while to develop. It's simply, it's not, it's not going to come through, you know, in a couple of years. Let me, let me ask you, uh, let's start with uh, the, one of your... Uh, um, long-term <laughs> development project, which was uh, the development of the technologies to introduce genes into mouse mm -hmm. ES cells, right? No, embryonic stem yeah. cells for the audience. So these, you take mice uh, embryo cells and you can uh, genetically modify them thanks to Dr. Kapecki. And this allows you to uh, ma map out the functional genome, basically. Could you, could you tell us how you really got started in that? Uh I mean, we came at that from uh, two perspectives. The first was really studying recombination, homologous recombination. At the time, people knew about homologous recombination, but they thought it was having to do with essentially sex. That is how you distribute uh, pieces of DNA from one parent, uh, from the two parents, and give uh, a child a distribution of those, uh, of those uh, uh, pieces of, of DNA. So uh, what, what we were finding is that actually all cells, that is somatic cells, skin cells, whatever, also have this machinery, and therefore we could take advantage of this machinery then to start utilizing it to change gene in a specific way. So that's how we got into that project. And then the other aspect was simply from what's called somatic cell genetics, where people were starting to play with cells and see whether could you actually generate mutations in cells culture itself. So those two combined and then allowed us to think about, well, what if we're able to actually change gene on a mouse? Uh, that would have an, a tremendous impact simply because uh, up to that time, all the mutations that have been gathered in mice were simply serendipities. That is, coat color mutants show up because we can obviously see different coat colors. But the things we were interested in, you know, how does the brain work or how does development occur, those kind of mutations sure. weren't coming through. So is that sort of like, uh, so homologous recombination is where you, you through recombinant DNA technology, you go put parts of the functional gene into your what your construct and then you throw it into the genome but very precisely at the place to knock out that gene or disrupt it or replace it mm -hmm. versus the randomness i suppose of exposing mice to mutagens and trying to find one that that has a change in in phenotype and in in, in in biology right so yeah, that was a huge sure. transition <laughs> and, and yeah, no, it's a big transition. And then the other thing that it allows us to do is to make very design changes. For example, to bring in a gene from uh, a, another organism, say one that turns the cells blue or turns them, the cells fluorescently green and so on, into the middle of a gene. So those kind of uh, changes could never occur in nature. So we can do things that uh, aren't conceivable in nature that will still allow us then to visualize what's happening and thereby infer what the function of that gene is. So this level of sophistication by homologous recombination is tremendous. I mean, it allows you to do things that would never happen in nature. I can remember in my early career in uh, plant biotechnology, we were at a point where we were pulling out genes because we could, but we couldn't really figure out how uh, the plants weren't amenable to, to uh, molecular biology at that state. And we thought, well, let's mutagenize and then hopefully maybe clone a gene that's related to some kind of super tall corn or uh, salt resistant wheat. But really the ability to go in and knock the genes out and, and break them apart is, is now an approach, the only approach I would ever take. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because yeah. it saves you the, the time of screening millions and millions and millions of, of organisms that are slow growing. That's correct. And, not, and also you. things that are difficult to, for example, if you want a recessive mutation where every two mutant genes, you have to do a lot of back crossing. And if you work with complex organisms like a mouse, that takes a lot of time and resources. So here we can just uh, inactivate both copies of a gene and then see what happens. And, and uh, there's a consortium now to uh, 
And, and what stage are they at in terms of uh, knocking out every... Uh, I mean, uh, uh, my guess is right now probably around two-thirds of the genes have been in, in, inactivated. Uh, uh, and, but we also want to construct, you know, much more complex. I mean, not only do you want to knock out the gene, but you want to be able to knock it out in a particular cell type at a particular time in development or post-development. Uh, you want to bring in reported genes that allow you to see things. So the, uh, the uh, level of sophistication is, you know, continually increasing right now. We normally work with one gene at a time. Uh, in the near future, we'll be working with you know half a dozen genes at a time, and each of them controlling them under separate, uh, different, uh, uh, you know, different temporal controls uh, and uh, spatial controls. We're going to uh, talk a little bit about some of the models, and uh, maybe talk a little bit about the genes that you're working on as well, um, and and how I, I suppose that these technologies can be applied to create human genetic models. Uh, but before we do so, I'd like to get this out of the way. I have to do an audible spot. So um, audible.com is a leading provider of audiobooks, and they have 75,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, fiction, nonfiction. They even have science. And uh, for the listeners of Futures in Biotech, they can go over to audible.com forward slash biotech and download a free book if they sign up to their account. But the account is free, and they have a two-week trial. And if they like it, they get to keep the free book. If they don't, they still... They can cancel the account, not pay a thing, and keep the free book. And what we normally do is we pick a book. And what I thought would be fun was picking DNA, The Secrets of Life, or The Secret of Life by James Watson, your mentor. And it's with uh, Andrew Berry and uh, narrated by Dan Cashman. And this book is, um, it's really, it's, it's, I, I find it's, it's a great way to get a picture of uh, uh, where a molecular biology is. I mean, it, uh, James Watson is a true authority and has made, played such an important role in developing the policy uh, uh, that has, you know, many countries have taken on, uh, including the Human Genome Project. And uh, this is a personal account and of modern genetic research and the technological and ethical challenges that it unleashes. So I'd urge you to go over and download DNA, The Secret of Life by James Watson with Andrew Berry and uh, download it for free. Uh, as I said, you can cancel your account and keep the free book if you like, or if you don't like Audible. Um, but I'm sure you will. So head over to audible.com forward slash biotech. We thank them for the support of Futures in Biotech. All right. So um, the we're, we're talking about manipulating single genes at a time, manipulating multiple genes uh, to create mice w uh, such that we can understand a scientific problem. Uh, would you like Maybe you could talk about, uh, or maybe I could ask you about the Hox genes and how you uh, are work using your um, technologies to um, understand them, and maybe tell us what they are. What are Hox genes? Sure. Uh, sure. Hox genes are essentially a, a set of genes, there are 39 of them in all mammals, which are involved in specifying where along your body axis you make certain things like organs, uh, you make your liver at a particular place, your kidneys are in a different position, your arms are at the right place and so on. So this allows you essentially to give positional value to your whole embryo and make the onlogger which then will make the different tissues that are appropriate for that region. And that's the normal function of uh, Hox genes. But uh, recently we've actually gotten involved in a completely unexpected function of Hox genes and that is actually in behavior. That is we inactivated a Hox gene which is called Hox B8 and gives rise to a very unexpected behavior that's very similar to humans with the OCD and OC spectrum disorder called trichotillomania where these patients actually pull out their hair uh, compulsively. Well, so that paper came out in May. Just yeah, itself. just recently, yeah. <laughs> just uh, oh, five weeks ago. So we'll right. put the link to the paper in our show notes. So uh -huh. can you tell us how how you how you figured that one out, um, and how 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 the, the the project sort of rolled rolled around? Because you, you've done some. Sure. There was an interesting. It was, it was a really interesting approach. 
Uh, I mean, the initial approach uh, was, uh, I always say we, and we is always the royal we, meaning graduate students, postdocs in the lab. Uh, and this work was started by a graduate student called Joey Greer. And what she did was simply to take movies of these mice. Uh, and because mice are mostly active at nighttime, she used infrared cameras and simply took movies 24 hours a day and then simply asked, what is the mouse doing? And what she found was that everything in terms of eating, drinking, running around the cage, building nests, walking upside down in the cage, you name it, everything was the same as controls except uh, grooming. And that is these mice were spending twice as much time grooming as normal mice. But in addition to it being simply more grooming, the grooming became pathological. That is, they continued to groom and still they actually started to remove the hair. And then at those same sites, they pretty soon they got uh, lesions. And this is common, for example, with OCD patients. What they do is they wash their hands all the time. And then pretty soon they actually have lesions on their hands because they're not getting the feedback to tell them that their hands are clean. And so then this mouse has that same uh, behavior pattern. Uh, this so is that was, for Hox, Hox B8. This is Hox B8. Yeah, it's one of the Hox genes. Run gene. gene. <laughs> and that gives you a very specific behavioral output. And so that was unexpected. You know, why should a Hox gene be involved in behavior? So then the next step was taken by another graduate student, uh, Xiaohua Chen, in the lab. And then what he found we could see the gene was expressed functioning in the brain, but the level was extremely low. And so what we do is to put it under, uh, put Hox B8, uh, a, a reporter gene, for example, GFP, green fluorescent protein. So wherever the gene functions, then those cells turn green. And so that allows us to have a take, robust take the assay. Dip switch that turns it on. Right. So, so you, you have a little bit of a lag. We have about a half second lag. So you put a little dip switch that turns the gene on and replace the gene with, so that you know where it's supposed to be turned on. And you put a right. green fluorescent protein. Right. And so then those cells turn green. And so then we look in the brain and see, you know, what cells are green. And this was an enormous surprise. And that is microglia. Now, microglia are immune cells of the brain. And there are two sources of microglia. There's one that is there very early in the embryo before you actually make blood vessels. And then there's a second that is actually after birth where it's coming from the bone marrow. It's the same as the blood cells, essentially. And then a, a particular a set of bone marrow cells, these are called monocytes, can actually infiltrate the brain, get across the bone marrow barrier, and then uh, occupy the brain. And it's those cells that were turning green. So now we display the question saying now how is an immune cell that normally scavenges dead cells in the brain now involving uh, uh, in uh, uh, you know maintaining a century uh, uh, behavior that is uh, making wow. sure that this uh, behavior didn't go awry and give you rise to pathological behavior so now we're in that process that is how does actually a microglia control behavior and now the prediction of that experiment <laughs> it's crazy very, yeah, it's really it's crazy. crazy and the prediction was very strong and that is we should be able to cure that behavior simply by a bone marrow transplant you irradiate the mouse, you wipe out its bone marrow, now plant, reimplant it with new bone marrow from a normal mouse, and does that cure that behavior? And the answer is yes, it works. And that was a real That's surprise. Amazing. So, and further, we can do the opposite experiment. That is, we can take a mutant bone marrow, put it into a normal mouse, and now that uh, mouse has the pathological behavior. So we can do it either way. Uh, and so now, you know, we have strong evidence that microglia are controlling behavior. And now that opens up a whole new chapter in terms of microbial biology. <laughs> That's an amazing uh, uh, story of, of science where you knock out one gene, you don't know what it does. Right. And, and if you knock out enough of them, you're going to find really, really interesting uh, events. And then the biology, that the cascade of biology is enormous. Yeah. And, and then you and never so expect I guess, Go ahead. And the other thing I should point out is that actually not only is it important for OCD or OC spectrum disorders like trichotillomania, but it turns out that most neuropsychiatric disorders, whether you're talking about monopolar, bipolar depression, autism, uh, schizophrenia, uh, OCD, OC spectrum disorder, even Alzheimer's disease, all of those have been known to have an association with the immune system. That is, patients that have monopolar depression often also have defects in their immune system. But it wasn't clear what, you know, what, why. 
Are you depressed and therefore your immune system isn't working well? Or is your immune system not working well, therefore you're at higher risk, risk of having depression? Okay, cause and effect wasn't clear, and even how those two were connected was not clear. And so now we're providing, a, you know, we're saying here microglia can affect, uh, which our immune systems uh, can affect essentially behavior. And these cells are coming from the bone marrow. We can actually light up, the, again, we can make bone marrow that's green and then ask, do those cells get into the brain and then uh, become microglia in the brain? And they do. So you've got this, this cell uh, disrupted in one gene, Hox B8, and it's a it's a uh, an immune cell that's in the brain that derives from bone marrow. I'm just seeing if I understand correctly. And that, while we don't understand necessarily the function of the disruption of the gene, you've now illustrated that a or not damaged, but a changed microglia, which is an immune cell, can have a enormous control over the behavior of that individual. That's right. That's right. I suppose that subtle changes in various uh, related genes down maybe in the cascade of the Hox8 or, or whatnot might, if it's further down, might modify different behaviors? That's right. I mean, and I, I think, yeah, we may just be at the tip of the iceberg in terms of how many behaviors are being controlled through microglia. So that's one aspect of it. And then the aspect, the other aspect is simply how is it doing it? And one can imagine, again, a lot of different scenarios, and they're not mutually exclusive. An example is one thing that immune cells all do is make cytokines. That's how they communicate with each other. So they may be making cytokines that are actually affecting neuronal circuits, which in turn are controlling this behavior. So that's one possibility, but that's just mm -hmm. one of, among many. So this may be a very, very strong oversimplification, but somebody who's washing their hands or grooming is trying to get rid of potential pathogens. That's right. And so they have a defective microglia in their brain, so they're out grooming uh, to remove any potential. They're scared of getting infected. Mm -hmm. is, is that like is that it? Is it as simple as that? That it could, the brain's that could be a connection. Yeah. No, I mean, in a sense, you know, uh, I mean, one is uh, removal of pathogens is extremely important. That is our defense against pathogens. If if we look at the part of our genome which has been evolving most rapidly, it always has to do with the immune system because that's our biggest threat in terms of our life existence. And as we uh, populations go up, then we're going to have actually more and more infections as opposed to less and less simply because it's a function of how dense people are, uh, are living you know, under those conditions that then spread those diseases. So I think, uh, so the defense against pathogens is extremely norm, uh, is, is enormous, okay? Mm -hmm. If we don't do it, we <laughs> die. Uh, on the other hand, why not con then connect your behavior to also that? I mean, so, you know, wouldn't it make sense if you have a behavior that gets rid of pathogens to connect it along with the immune system that actually kills those pathogens once they break that barrier? So that's one way of sort of, sort of seeing why there is a connection essentially between immune system controlling behavior, which would be consistent again with getting rid of pathogens. Uh, that's simply a way of looking at evolution to say, no, why hook these things up together? Would it be, uh, would it, so you grew your mice in sterile environments. Would it be possible that even though they are grown in a sterile environment, that there's a potential pathogen that the Hawks B8 microglia couldn't get? And so that you now are somewhat mildly infected with a, a non-lethal pathogen in the brain. And then that is triggering the, the behavioral pattern. You have it. No, I mean, I think, uh, you know, how you get to pathological, you know, you have a behavior that's doing something good. And then all of a sudden now it becomes pathological. And the question mm -hmm. is, you know, why is that happening? And I think, again, thinking along the lines you've just indicated, maybe a reason, maybe a way of looking at that aspect of it. Um, either that the pathological behavior under certain circumstances actually has some advantage, or alternatively, simply the whole system has gone awry. I mean, one of the things we're thinking about is that, 
Uh, one of the things that's common in terms of uh, OCD, it's common actually with respect to a lot of other neuropsychiatric disorder, is anxiety. Uh, you know, fear, anxiety, uh, simply getting your adrenaline system going up too, uh, too heavily. So I think there, there may also be a connection. That is that, there are, that you're trying to control all of these different types of behaviors by reducing essentially the level of anxiety, which may also be important for, for example, people to be able to communicate with each other. I mean, initially we were all running around pretty much in in isolation, and now all of a sudden mm-hmm. we're starting to get together, and we have to break down those anxiety levels in order to be able to communicate and uh, interact with each other. So again, that may be an important selective uh, advantage of this type of behavior. It's amazing. So, it, and it's it, I, I guess when you read the paper, you're, you're nobody would expect. And that's what makes the the science uh, fun. So nobody would expect that a potential cure for OCD would be a bone marrow transplant. That's right. And I guess you could do a partial one. You wouldn't have to get rid of the bone marrow. You just have to pull some out, modify it. Right. You know. Well, I mean, I think that's one possibility. And my, you know, right now, bone marrow transplants are fairly risky. That is, approximately one percent of patients actually die of just a procedure. Uh, but mm-hmm. uh, you know, as people start doing more and more bone marrow transplants, I'm sure you know people will develop the technologies which will allow them not to be as uh, as high a risk. So that's one aspect. But the other aspect simply is that we know a lot more about our immune system than we know about how our brain works and how Mm -hmm. uh, drugs affect essentially neuropsychiatric disorders. And what this says is pay attention to the immune deficiency because you know a lot more about them and you can control them much more effectively. Well, there's some really interesting work being done on HIV and um, the bone marrow where they don't genetically modify. It's I think it's a CCR5 gene that you want to disrupt Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. to become resistant to HIV. And what they did is I think they lowered the viral titer in in patients where they did a partial bone marrow transplant, Mm -hmm. which I think would be much less risky than an entire bone marrow transplant. No, not it's, going it's for leukemia. When you knock it for... all out, if it doesn't uh, reimplant efficiently, then you're in deep trouble. So that you know, if a partial one would be much uh, have lower risk. That's true. And then again, I think uh, you know what that also makes is quantitative differences. And and many diseases, you know, you have to have a threshold value. And if you can get below that threshold value, then it's no longer a threat. And and that's true of HIV, for example. How about culturing some uh, ES cells or not embryonic stem cells? It's just adult stem cells to form microglia with uh, Hox uh, B8 uh, and then re- uh, give a patient uh, uh, a monthly dose of its own of their own cells. Of its own cells. No, I, and I think those kind of things, uh, I think people will be looking in the future. I mean, that's one <laughs> aspect of essentially, you know, all of the uh, therapies that have to do with stem cell therapy. I mean, there are m- and many, many diseases, are, I think, will be profited by that technology. Uh, what I think is really fun is that uh, your science, the science we're talking about coming out of your lab is right at the pivotal point that breaks out, breaks open a whole field. That's of, right. Uh, no, I think that's, and, that's, that's what, then that, that's when uh, science is really ex- exciting is <laughs> when all of a sudden you see things that, you know, juxtaposed that previously uh, you never uh, thought about, uh, that there were relationships among, you know, disparate uh, systems. Uh, and I think what this says is, you know, one is we're extremely complex, and we always knew that, but uh, the level of complexity, the more we get into it, is the greater and greater because of many of these systems are interacting in unexpected ways. Would you like to talk a little bit about, um, uh, well, one, how, what is your next project on the Hawks B8? How, what's your, uh-huh. how are you going to approach it? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I think uh, there's one aspect of microglia that people are just beginning to appreciate. They sort of look like neurons. They have these enormous extensions and they are putting them out and they reef, uh, take them in and they're waving around in space. The cell body itself is standing still, but these arms, these sort of tentacles are sweeping the, uh, the whole system. And in fact, we can calculate that within about an, an hour's period, the microglia uh, these, these pseudopods are actually covering the entire brain surface. Okay? So they're moving around all the time and then all of a sudden they stop. 
And then they stay there and they stay there and they stay there. The question is, you know, what, what's happening? And if, when you look, what, they, what you find is that these protrusions are actually now in intimate contact with the synapse, the connection between neurons that are communicating with each other. And they're really there, tightly bound to it. And the question is, why are they doing that? And, you know, and if you're there and you're really tightly holding on to it, are you actually regulating it? And so this would be an exciting area where all of a sudden, you know, uh, <clears throat> A microglia, which is simply supposed to be there to gobble up dead cells, are mm -hmm. now actually in contact with synapses and, and modulating that circuit. So that's one area we want to go into, is to try to define, is there actually electrical contacts between essentially a microglia and uh, neurons? And can they interact with specific circuitries? I mean, for example... Uh, in OCD, we know the circuit that's involved in terms of generating repetitive behavior. It's a fairly well-defined circuit. In fact, it's known as the OCD circuit. Uh, and so we know where to look. And now the question is, are microglia a part of that system? <laughs> I'm digesting this because this is amazing. The, so microglia might actually be functional pseudoneurons that right. are changing processing in the human brain. And, and, you know, and there's a lot of data now that indicates, I mean, our, you know, if we look at our brain, it's actually about 10% neurons and 90% glia. And there are all types of glia, microglia being one of them, and astroglia being another and so on. And there is more and more evidence that these glia are actually participating in many, many functions in the brain. And it's not just neurons that are doing all the communication. That's amazing. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, um, God, that, that's a lot of work. I'm, I'm thinking about how to uh, go about, you know, looking at the electrophysiology of microglia's interactions with neurons. Like, like co-cultures, are you going to grow them together and uh, sort of break no, it down that uh, way? What the problem is that... Uh, I mean, when, for example, if you stick a needle in your brain, okay, what happens is you're going to be killing some cells as that needle's going in. And then what happens is the microglia now change their shape and then become more amoeboid, uh, amoeboid like and actually travel to that disruption and then start trying to uh, fix the problem that is, uh, uh, gobble up dead cells, pick up debris, and so on. So any perturbation you do to the brain now activates these microglia to do something else. Okay. So what we want to be able to do it, I mean, it's very difficult, is uh, study the microglia in the brain without perturbing the brain. Uh, and that uh, utilizes things like two-photon microscopy and so on, which allows us to penetrate the brain but not uh, disrupt the brain. That's amazing. Uh, two-photon microscopy for the audience is, is a three-dimensional microscopy that allows you to see deep into the brain of a mouse. Well, fairly deep, I suppose. Yep. And, and see if, if you're using genetics. And I'd, I'd uh, refer people back to um, our episodes. We had, did two episodes with Marty Chalfie on how to use GFP. Mm -hmm. It's a green fluorescent protein. You can put it behind a dip switch of, a, of the gene you're studying. Uh, uh, and, and, and then you can actually see the functional aspects uh, uh, and where the, the protein is being made live. That, so you can knock it out, turns green, and now you're... Do you expect the microglia for the Hox B8 genes to be uh, diff, like not knowing where to go and what part of the brain? That's, and maybe yeah, now that's, there's... A, yeah, now, now the first thing to ask is simply, is their behavior now different? Are they, for example, wave, still waving their arms around but not making contacts with synapses anymore? Uh, you know, what, what is different about it? Do they respond? I mean, one question we would like to answer is, if we now tweak the neurons, does this now excite the microglia? Okay, and are they now excited and, they, and they're starting to put out their protrusions to that area? So is there a relationship it's, mm -hmm. it's between neural activity and what, how the microglia are interacting with that uh, activity? So there are, you know, many, many types of experiments one can do and it'll, keep, it'll occupy us for a while. <laughs> how about a, a registry for for HOXB8, this one uh, gene, do patients with OCD have various mutations that make it partially functional, completely disrupted, or, you know, are the initiation uh, site mutations? You know, no, I mean, it turns out, for example, with trichotillomania, 
and OCD separately affects about 3% of all populations have been tested and many populations have been tested. So it seems to be broadly uh, affect many, many different people and types of people. So one thing we can ask if there's that many, you know, are there Hoxby mutations, for example, in patients that have OCD or trichotillomania itself? And if so, what are these types of mutations that are affecting it? Uh, so that's one aspect of, uh, of the study that we can do. Uh, and I think the other thing that's interesting is that people are doing a lot of bone marrow transplants. I mean, around 300,000 have been done. Mm -hmm. uh, and the question is, you know, uh, is there any data uh, as to what the uh, effects of those bone marrow transplants have been? Wow. And among, those, among that population, there has to be people that have OCD, have, uh, you know, monopolar de <coughs> Uh, depression and so on, and can one uh, can one start gleaning some uh, uh, story essentially from all of these bone marrow transplants that have already been done? If people have kept you know very good notes as, as essentially what the outcomes have been, so you know so we're trying to see whether we can uh, get a hold of that type of data and see whether retrospectively we can find anything out that's already been available. Much in the same way that the patient that was uh, had a bone marrow transplant was became resistant to HIV, which is incredible. If you could see a bone marrow transplant patient have differential behavior, That's right. uh, cured of of psychological uh, disorders because of their microglia, right. <laughs> and then everybody's going to go down and read <laughs> paper one by. Uh, but the, I, I I don't have the name of the first author. I, I was looking always at the senior Shop author here. Check. Uh, Shaq Chen was the, uh, he's a graduate student. He was the primary author in that paper. What a yeah. brilliant project. That's amazing. A lot of science, and there's going to be a lot of careers uh, spent trying to figure out the function of microglia now. It's, and and uh, all I hope a lot of other scientists get into it and, uh, you know, and, and start do, uh, asking those questions also. I mean, what, what's fun is when, if you can draw other people to also work on that problem. Um, I, I guess that's your talent. <laughs> so by studying these Hox genes, um, how many genes have you uh, disrupted in mice and seen, uh, you know, changes in organ function development and behavior? This is the first behavioral one? Uh, this is the first behavioral one. Uh, we've inactivated all 39 uh, and we're starting all of them. And they all have multiple effects. I mean, they're, uh, they're really, you know, each Hox gene is controlling hundreds of other genes. They're essentially uh, orchestrators. They turn genes on and they turn genes off and so on. And so, and they're doing many, many different things. So, so it's a, you know, a very complicated uh, study and that'll occupy us forever because it's, uh, you know, it's, it's endless in a sense. The deeper you go, the greater your understanding. Uh, they're involved in, uh, for example, motor neurons, which control all of your movements. How, uh, what specifies that certain motor neurons go into your arm and other ones go into your legs and, and particular muscles in the arm and so on. There are over 50 different muscles in the arm that have to be controlled. All of this is being done under the control of Hox genes. Amazing. So you have to really, when you're approaching the science... You, ha you have to have a cl clearly an open mind and one willing to crack the books open to, oh, yeah. to, to really understand the human body. It often takes you in directions that you never anticipated. I mean, you know, when we started, for example, there were no atlases for the uh, mouse brain, okay? And so what we did was use human atlases and simply looked at see where are the different parts in the uh, human brain and, and then we could find them essentially where they are in the, in the mouse. Now there are many, many atlases in the mouse brain and rat brain and so on. But, uh, you know, all of a sudden, if you need some information, you have to find wherever you can find it. Absolutely. You're looking, you want to not study the part this I want cheese part of the brain, but you want the, <laughs> <laughs> the one that's similar to human. Uh, do you have an MRI in the lab? Are you uh, studying uh, blood flow and, and, uh, and ion movement in the brain using MRI? Yeah. I mean, we don't have one in the lab, but we do have one at the university, which is uh, okay. fairly high, sophisticated one that allows us to get uh, down to the resolution that we required for mice. I mean, one of the things we would be excited about is, you know, imaging in the brain is becoming much, much more sophisticated. And in a very few years, you'll be able to actually do imaging in the brain and say this person actually has schizophrenia and that this type of schizophrenia or has monopolar depression and so on. Simply from looking at the imaging, you'll be able to infer essentially disease and you can use that as a diagnostic tool. 
But what's exciting for us is, you know, we have a very difficult time figuring out what the mouse is thinking about. If it has a headache, you know, that's, that's <laughs> a major problem for us. But if we could use human imaging to interpret what the mouse is thinking about, then all of a sudden, you know, we'll uh, be essentially at a, a new level, sure. essentially, sophistication of what we can do in the mouse. Well, Eric Kendall presented at the uh, 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 neuroscience meeting in Chicago last year, uh, these intelligent mice, or he called them intelligent. Maybe they could help you. Maybe we could <laughs> push them over the limit and they could answer your questions while they're uh, in the MRI. Right. Maybe best go with humans. <laughs> Sorry, but I digress. Mm -hmm. um, would you like to talk about, uh, we have a few more minutes. Would you like to talk about uh, the new mouse model for, uh, and I can't pronounce it, alveolar, Rhabdomyosarcoma. Yeah, we're, we're putting a big effort into sarcomas. And one question you might ask is, you know, why sarcomas? In humans, carcinomas are much more prevalent, prevalent than, uh, sarcom than sarcomas are. But sarcomas affect a very important segment of the population, and that is children and young adults. Uh, most cancers affect older people, and the, the older you get, the higher the probability you'll get this or that type of carcinoma. This affects, they're extremely aggressive, and therefore affect essentially very young population. Uh, and being aggressive, for example, uh, in, in many of these sarcomas, the probability right now is that after first presentation, 80% of those children are likely to die in five years. Okay, so uh, that's really aggressive. And so it's, it's an also because they're not as common, drug companies aren't as interested. Okay, so there's a niche. Uh, and so that's what we've been going into, and alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, synovial sarcoma, uh, all sorts of sarcomas are now be uh, uh, we're modeling them. And the big advantage is we know how they begin. Okay, if you're a modeler, you want to start at the beginning rather than the middle or the end. Okay, normally when you get a tumor, you have the end state, and you have a whole series of steps that have occurred, six or seven that are important for that particular tumor, but you don't know the order, you don't know whether it's always a. A, B, C, D, or is there different combinations that can give rise to the same tumor and so on. But in this case, uh, one is it's simpler and it's very rapid and therefore I think we'd be able to identify all the different steps uh, very early in these uh, models. So that's why we're excited about them and uh, we're modeling them and we've got, I mean the other nice thing about science now is that the criteria of saying is this a good model for humans is getting mm -hmm. better and better. We can look at thousands of genes and they're expression patterns and say you know, they're the same as humans or not and rather than simply saying you know while well, this gene is the same at least maybe it's the same type of tumor okay so the criteria is in is uh, improved and therefore we can evaluate uh, that uh, uh, that tumor uh, in the mouse and say it really is human uh, sarcoma in this case alveolar rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma or synovial sarcoma or whatever uh, and what starts them is two chromosomes breaking and then rejoining. And so uh, the information content is pretty much the same, uh, but at the joint where you put now two different chromosomes together, all of a sudden you've created uh, a new gene, which is half of one gene and half of another mm -hmm. gene. Okay, and it's that thing that actually is starting the sarcomas. So we have a way of, of identifying that uh, gene and then initiating the tumor in the right step and then asking with respect to thousands of genes, is it the same as the human tumor? And the answer is yes. So I think we're confident in our model and now uh, what we're trying to do is convince people to actually use a, a mouse model to actually do things like uh, screening for drugs and so on that may affect the uh, outcome of that tumor. Well, you know, the more, more that you can bring information with respect to the drug target and move that forward and give confidence that that is truly the drug target that's be used to, that could be used to develop a drug, um, brings us closer to the threshold of doing the drug development. Drug development is engineering. It's not science. Um, it's what we do here at uh, my company. And we know what the target is. So we lower the threshold of entry into pharmacology. And it's all based on a mouse knockout. So uh, without your work, I wouldn't have a job. And uh, we, I wouldn't have the opportunity to try and save a million lives a year based on the target that we're working on. And um, I can see that uh, the Nobel Committee got it right and that the technology that you developed um, while being uh, uh, it, it's a cornerstone to modern medicine but that the real fun part
is using it. <laughs> That's right. And, and, uh, no, and that, I think, and that, and that, uh, what I'm hoping is, you know, I'll, I'll be able to work another 30, 40 years, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, be able to be continually to contribute uh, to this ever increasing uh, about body of knowledge. I mean, one of the things that's really nice about science is it's, it is a real community, and it's a community that doesn't have any borders. Good science can be done in any country, uh, and then we build upon whatever other people have built on, and then we can hopefully extend it, and then other people will build on our contributions. And that brings essentially a community that's, you know, it's undis. Uh, unprecedented in any other uh, in any other venture. I mean, I think science truly can talk across borders in a ways that uh, isn't possible in any other sphere. Well, the great, great, one of the great aspects of being a scientist is that you live without borders. I'm Canadian. I'm working in the United States. We have people from all around the world here. And uh, that's, so I would encourage people to go into science if they love to experience life in a different country and, and, and may possibly bring that home or uh, introduce new ideas to countries that, you know, that, that exchange of ideas. Well, you know, it's been an incredible honor uh, to have you on the show. And I thank you for your, the, the work that you've done, because as I said, it's enabled me to do my work and the work uh, for the next entire generation of life scientists are going to, uh, you know, are counting on the technology that you've developed and, and its ability to dissect the human genome. Um, so thank, thank you. you very much for coming on. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, it's a pleasure. I, uh, th we were uh, talking to uh, Mario Capecchi, uh, Distinguished Professor of Human Genetics and Biology at the University of Utah and investigator at, uh, with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And he is the uh, a Nobel Laureate uh, from 2007 for his work, uh, or a Nobel Laureate in Physiology or Medicine, for the discoveries and principles of in for introducing gene spe uh, specific gene modifications in mice and the use of embryonic stem cells. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Yep. Um, I'd, I'd also like to thank Lorraine uh, Stitzer and Ryan, who's uh, helping out in uh, Utah and for helping uh, set up the production. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, John Salanina for handling the audio and video boards and recording today th and, and coming in early because <laughs> it's very early on the West Coast. I'd also like to thank the team uh, that made this possible, Leo Laporte, Dane Golan, uh, Eric Lanigan, Tony Wang, Frederick Louis, and the rest of the team in Petaluma, California. And I thank you, Leo, for, for being patient. Uh, I know we used your studio at a, an awkward time and I really appreciate your patience. <laughs> um, and lastly, I'd like to thank Phil Peltier and Will Hall for the opening and closing themes for Futures in Biotech. I'm Mark Peltier.